the Tim Conway Jr. Show live at 97.1 FM Talk. And now a guy who makes me laugh as much as Doug Steckler, Adam Carolla. How are you, sir? I'm great, Timmy. How are you doing, Doing brother? excellent, man. Great to be on the show this evening. <laughs> <laughs> you know, yeah, when you, for me, <laughs> when I'm you like first... Captain Sully, just logging time. You know what I mean? I'm getting experience on the air. And when, for free. <laughs> when you first agreed awesome. uh, to come on with us, it was like for five minutes every Friday night, uh, you know, give or take a week or two. And now we've locked you into like a, another job. <laughs> Yeah, I know. That's my, that's my assistant on the other line telling me to call you. <laughs> Smooth move, x -Lax. Hey, do you remember, uh, you and I grew up in the Valley around the same time. Hold on, let me just time. say something real quick. Sure. I just got done skipping my rope, so I'm a little out of wind, but that's fine. I was watching How We Do It. Right. The Howie Mandel show. Yeah, right. When a guy who looks exactly like Howie Mandel, except for with Burt Reynolds toupee <laughs> and wraparound cop glasses that he chooses to wear indoors, <laughs> asks you to dump a giant tub of marmalade jelly on your head and then dance around like a queer bait, go ahead and suspect something might be up. <laughs> hey, it's Howie Mandel, one of the most recognizable guys in television for the last 20 years, using the same voice with a crazy wig on. Right. He's, he's wearing Rip Taylor's wig <laughs> and he's wearing ski sunglasses <laughs> indoors and his plan is he has a new perfume called uh, Eau de Farce <laughs> and he needs you to put a funnel in your ass. <laughs> Go ahead and suspect something's up, America. <laughs> and the nice thing about that is when he gets an idea like that, he doesn't drive in the ground. It doesn't go on longer than 30, now, 40 now, minutes. 30, 45 minutes out, that's to out outside that's sometimes they run as short as the low 30 33 34 minutes yeah how long and by the way it's not like he's you know it's 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 not like he's uh you know the master of, of voices or anything i mean for christ's sake the guy just uses his regular voice yeah you know i actually i'm a, a huge fan of howie mandel's stand-up and and he I, I heard that he actually listens to the show occasionally and he gets pissed when I say this, but I'm but I'm actually telling you the truth. I was a huge fan when he was doing stand up, and he had that handbag. Remember yeah, the bag that was sure. in the shape of a hand? Clever stuff. And then he'd put a uh, blow up a uh, like a you know surgeon's glove and put it on his head I, on his head. I actually liked that. I thought that was hysterical. And he thinks I'm busting his balls over it. Well, you know, I, I think the problem is your use of the word actually. <laughs> because I get those compliments. Like, your movie, it was actually good. <laughs> if you go up a couple octaves and you put the word actually in front right. of stuff. That's like, a major insult. See, like, you can say to your wife, I enjoyed having sex with you. But if you say... I actually enjoyed having sex with you, and you go up an octave, there's right. going to be trouble. So maybe you shouldn't put, you shouldn't qualify it with actually. Okay. I actually enjoy that stuff you did. And then you, you can slide in these. I don't care what anyone says. I thought it was funny. <laughs> I like, I, I've had to tell people, like, please stop complimenting me. I'm going to kill myself. <laughs> I actually enjoyed the movie. I actually enjoyed it. Yeah, it's like when you go to a restaurant, too. Man, I actually enjoyed that meal. Yeah, yeah. I, thought I, was, I thought I was going to die and get the radical diarrhea, but I actually enjoyed yeah, that. Yeah, I actually yeah. enjoyed oh, it. Uh, speaking of restaurants, do you remember you and I grew up in the Valley at the same time? You remember in the late 70s, early 80s, through the mid 80s, when they tried to jam soup and salad bars down our throat along Ventura Boulevard? Yeah, they tried to ram salad, soup, and then, and then about three years later... We became enamored with the rat sandwich. <laughs> it's a rat. <laughs> Bread, the, the toast wasn't cutting it. <laughs> after, after a million years of eating crap on toast, somewhere in 1986, someone declared fat. <laughs> Enough already. The toast is, its run has come to an end. We must wrap all sandwiches. Right. And the wrap just tears apart two bites into the sandwich and it's over. First off, we have something called a burrito. Do we not? <laughs> we, we already have a wrap. It's a Mexican sandwich. It's called a burrito. And then secondly, have you ever been at, like, Art's Deli eating a corned beef sandwich and go, ah, this just isn't cutting it. So 
Something's missing. The swirl effect, perhaps. I'm missing a whirlpool of sandwich here. And by the way, you ever try to put mustard or mayo on a wrap? It's like you have to you have to dab it on. You have to right. stipple it on the top. Jesus right. Christ! What You're, was that whole wrap sandwich conspiracy that we bought into? I don't, and it's still going on. I, the other day, I was at the the California Chicken Cafe. He goes, "You want to try the new wrap?" I'm like, "Oh man, these the wraps! I'm, I, I I've never had one. The I other can't thing, imagine." The it. other thing about the wrap is one of the great things about a sandwich. Let me explain. I know you have a lot of listeners in the wrap and sandwich industry, and I just want to talk to them for a second. Sandwich was originally designed to travel in a lunch pail. <laughs> and it could make it through, you know, a good four or five hours sitting out in the sun, baking in that tin box, and still be good by noon that day, you know? Right. The wrap, it don't travel. The wrap gets soggy and weird. Its skin is too thin. You ever bring home half the wrap and try to eat it the next day? It's like seagull crap and foil. There's nothing there. It's completely decomposed. The bread holds up. You can take a you can take a deli sandwich home or a turkey sandwich home and eat it the following day. Oh yeah, absolutely. The wrap yeah. don't travel, Tim. God damn it. That wrap don't travel. Dude. The wrap don't travel. And it has no home in the Corolla house. <laughs> Say that right now. Speaking of rest, do you remember, uh, obviously you remember Hamburger Hamlet. I don't know if uh, yeah. if you went to the one on Van Nuys Boulevard. I don't think it's still there. And, uh, yeah, is I, it still it there? was there up until, uh, you know, I mean, I think it is. Oh, all right. But there was always a rumor going around. There's two restaurants in town that had rumors that were never uh, substantiated that, that, <clears throat> that uh, if you worked at Hamburger Hamlet as a waiter, you had to be gay. And if you worked at the Apple Pan, you were an ex-con. Did you have you ever heard those two rumors? Well, the Apple, the Apple Pan one, yeah. That, that there are there are the places that hire like the three-time losers. Yeah, I mean, I have seen that. There's all there. I mean, there's a couple of places that do that, which is kind of weird. There's uh, there's like uh, Anna Walt Lumber on La Brea, where like every time you're behind the counter, there's a super heavy set Latino chick with a teardrop tattoo and Chewy written on her forehead. Arm and you're like, oh, I get it. You've been in the joint. So there are a yeah. couple places to do it. Yeah, I think Apple Pan does that. And uh, as far as the hamburger Hamlet goes, it's got the word Hamlet in it. Right. So I would assume that would attract the gays. <laughs> Because, you know, that's a very gay-sounding word, <laughs> Hamlet. And, you know, I, I'll bet, you know, here's what I'll bet it is. A lot of people in theater are gay, and a lot of people in theater have to work waiting gigs. Right. So thus, you're going to have a much higher concentration of gays in the restaurant waiter gig than you would in the construction field, well, for instance. You know, uh, again, Adam Carolla is with us. When, when you're at a Hollywood party, and I, I assume that you've been to a few in your life, Couple. It is uh, so much easier for a guy to admit to other guys that he's into the old stick of room mm -hmm. than it is if he said he's a Republican. Oh, yeah. I mean, the, you yeah, know, back, I never back in the, about that. Back in the seventies, that did, that was reversed. Yeah, you, you they, look, you, you uh, look. If I if I said, uh, hey. Uh, Guess who I'm porking? Tim Conway Jr. <laughs> they throw me ticker tape parade. If I said, yeah, you know, I don't mind McCain too much, uh, I'd be attacked with with an end table. It's crazy. Yeah, it what, really is. What's up? I don't know what happened. <laughs> what happened? We're, we need to go back a little bit, right? Yeah, and I think it it happened almost overnight. It did. You know, I, when we weren't looking, all of a sudden, uh, bang! It's uh, honorable to marry. A guy for a guy to marry another guy, but it is an absolute disgrace to vote for a war veteran for president. Well, it, it's basically you know if you uh, if, if you're Republican or you vote for McCain or you vote Republican, you're just you're xenophobe and you're right. a racist. And, right. Oh, don't be so naive. You don't know how the world works. You know, you know what bullies we are, and so on and so forth. Right. L listen. Uh, this is all just a, a complete, uh, complete uh, load of crap. I mean, obviously, we're the best country in the world, or everyone wouldn't be fleeing to us all the time and constantly. I mean, it's a pretty easy math. The rest of the world hates us. Why are they swimming every river and climbing every mountain to get here? Yeah, they risk their lives to get here, to this crappy country. Right. I hate Poland. You yeah. see me trying to get there this weekend? <laughs> <laughs> Have any vacation plans to go to Poland? I was in the the, the uh, parking lot after uh, one of our uh, uh, shows, and I was talking to a young lady, 
and she said, uh, she said, I heard a rumor that you were uh, a, a big fan of George Bush. I said, uh, yeah, that's uh, true. And she says, how dare you? I mean, are you still a big fan? I said, yeah, I happen to be. And she looked at me and turned away as if I, you know, just, uh, you know, farted in her face. Well, here's here's my whole point with all these Yahoo blowhard lefties. I don't claim to know, and you don't know either. You know, when they try to explain to me what's going on in Guantanamo Bay, right. like you have some special information from your crappy rent-controlled <laughs> one-bedroom apartment in Santa Monica <laughs> that CNN and Fox aren't privy to. Hey, James Bond, <laughs> you don't know ass about what's going on in Guantanamo Bay, so don't pretend to know, and I don't either, so shut your face right. and let the pros handle it, number one. Number two, all this, oh, you know, you know, we're just creating more terrorists. Really? Where's your proof? <laughs> Zero terrorist attacks on American soil in the last right. seven or eight years? Yeah. yeah, that's your proof? You idiots, you don't know. And number three, look, the rest of the world hates us because we're prosperous. It's like one big high school, and we're the kid who's pulling up in the convertible Porsche. Right, exactly. Did, 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 did you see Pretty in Pink? Yes. We're James Spader. <laughs> we're sitting out front smoking a cigarette. <laughs> we've got a sweater, maybe two sweaters, one around the waist, one around the shoulders. Right. We're wearing Italian loafers with no socks. We're blowing our cigarette around. We're leaning against our red Porsche. Right. And we're explaining to Ducky Boy what it's like. Yeah, and if you F with us, uh, it's the end of you. Right. So the rest of the world hates us because the rest of the world is jealous of us, and that's the way it's always going to be. We're the prom king and the prom queen of the world, and they will hate us for us, and they will always hate us for that. Yeah. And the Middle East will always hate us because of our lifestyle, because of our freedom, and because of our choices. Right. But, you know, with uh, with the Middle East, um, I understand the vibe there a little that, you know, it's it's a it's a, a whole area of the world run by men for men. Right. Uh, women can't drive. Women can't vote. Women can't do this. Women can't read. They can't get educated. And so I understand them going, uh, hmm, you know, the United States is filled with a bunch of, uh, you know, pussy whipped uh, dudes. Uh, we're in the you know the Middle East where we run things. We run the show. So I understand it on on, a, on that level. Look, you can judge. It, Tim, just dig this vibe for a second. Let me get heavy with you. <laughs> you can dig any nation. You can judge them by how they treat their females. Because all a female is is the weaker of the two. And it's like this. you got a roommate. One guy is a professional football player, and the other guy is a jockey. Now... You show me a roommate who does the dishes, pays half his rent, utilities, does everything, even Steven, even though he could crush the other guy, I will show you an evolved, <laughs> I will show you an evolved guy. Right. You show me a guy that says, look, I got 60 pounds on you, bitch, and I'm going to backhand you if you don't get in the kitchen and start cooking and you don't put a pillowcase over your head. I will show you an unevolved. <laughs> yeah, now, you have a point. simple, pure, and simple. We realize that we're stronger than women, that we're smarter than women, but yet, yet we don't take advantage of it. We don't because we're evolved. And any culture that is not evolved beats the crap out of women simply because they can. They take advantage of the people they can take advantage of. They're called bullies. And take a look at the cultures that treat their women the best, and take a look at the cultures that treat, find the top five that treat the women the best, and the bottom five that treat them the worst. I'll show you the most evolved and the least evolved. And here's the thing with the bullies. The second the bullies think they got ten pounds on you and two inches on you, they will start to kick your ass. And they can't understand why we don't blow them back into the Stone Age. And sometimes they mistake that for weakness and they puff their chests out right. because they have a bully mentality. They bully women. They bully any country around them. They bully anyone they think they can bully. And if they thought they could get away with destroying this country, they would do it in a heartbeat. Oh, absolutely. A second. Yeah. And every other country would do the same goddamn thing to this country. And that's what people don't understand. If Japan had won World War II, they would have taken taking our crap over in a second. Germany, all of them. We're the only country in the world that will beat your country and then get your economy back up and running and then 
clear out after two years. Exactly right. You know, back when when World War II was happening, then we were fighting, you know, the Japanese and the Germans. Everybody in the country rallied around the United States for, you know, for those two wars and also Korea and for the most part, uh, Vietnam. But now you get, uh, you know, you get kids nowadays saying, uh, you know, Gitmo should be closed because we're we're taking away the rights of of uh, the terrorists. There's, right? like, there's two. Hundred and forty something guys over there. That's it. Two hundred and forty. Who gives a rat's ass? They get their prayer prayer shawls. They they get their they get all their crap, and they get the three hots and a cot. And by the way, I'm not signing off on the notion that everyone at Getmo is an innocent cab driver from Tikrit. I'm assuming they're there for a reason, and I'll trust our government to handle it. Who gives a crap? Exactly Please, right. people, move on to real topics. There's, uh, there's literally less than a junior high class at an average high, average size junior high here in the Southland over at some plot of land in Cuba. Get over it. Yeah. No, I went to uh, elementary school out in the valley, and and there were more kids in the fifth and sixth grade than they have down there. Right. It's and unreal. they have plenty of studies where these guys got released and went right back into action. So just shut up and let the pros handle it, you fairies. Uh, Adam Carolla is with us. I saw something today. Every once in a while you see something that you haven't seen in 30 years. And you look at it and go, how dare that guy do that? Oh, wait a minute. 30 years ago, I did that. How, how should, oh, why yeah, can I get down I, and... I can't pass judgment on almost anything. But I saw this happen today. It was a guy in the valley who had his car up on the curb. Two wheels on the curb, two wheels on the street. Changing the oil. Changing the oil. Let it, <laughs> was he letting it drop into the, the, the storm drain? Right into the storm drain, into the uh, water. Look, uh, Tim, I, I know what you're thinking, and I got. I used to stuff. do that. We got to stop these Jews. <laughs> we have to. They're out of control, and I know we don't want to turn this into a racist thing, but we know it was a Jew, and we know what he was doing, and we see it all the time. And these people don't come from a land where they recycle, and the Jews are constantly flushing the transmission fluid and the engine oil down, and it goes right down the LA River, right out into the Pacific, right into the harbor there. And I'm going to say. Something because I, I know people don't want to be called anti semite or they're scared of you know the Hollywood community you know you know Steven Spielberg's not going to cast them in the next movie but I'm going to say something you Jews knock it off you go to the Pep Boys and let them change your oil with everybody else all the Mexicans and all the white people all right. right? It's out of control. But, it really is. But don't I you... see another guy with a prayer shawl in the Yamka <laughs> underneath his pickup truck with a big gardener's cage around it, the weed whacker rolling around in there, just dumping it straight into the straight into the storm drain. I'm I'm I'm, I'm, I'm going to say something. <laughs> but do you remember doing that when you got your first car? Yeah. Yeah, you just popped it right up on the curb and uh, you know release the valve and it's over. Yeah, it's like I could buy a pan and a check stand, or I could just roll it up my neighbor's driveway halfway up and let it go that way, yeah. Now what you see is guys going to uh, the auto zone with their old oil. Yeah, and they're turning it in. Yeah, and they throw it into a bin. I'd never do that. You know, you want to know, you want to know what's worse than they change the oil into the storm drain? Hmm. I haven't seen this in a while, but I used to see it a lot. The pyramid of cigarette butts that the guy <laughs> empties from his car ashtray on the side of the road. Yeah. Like, really? You just circumnavigate the globe blowing butts until they're actually bursting from your ashtray. And at a certain point, after collecting every single ash and every every butt in the tray, you're just going to pull over and dump it just on the ground. This is the middle of the street. What an a-hole. How big an a-hole do you have to be? It usually happens in like a John's or Vaughn's parking lot. Right. Like you. Well, first off, why bother collecting them <laughs> right. if you're going to dump them that way? Right. And then secondly, you really you can't time this, so you pull in your driveway and just dump them in the trash can in the driveway. They're going to make a pyramid of these things. <laughs> and who's using the ashtray in the car anymore? I. That's you know, a, once you're done with that cigarette, you don't want the smell around. It's out the window. I, you know that it's probably it's probably why it was a like an old school move. But uh, how big a douchebag do you have to be for that move? And then secondly, here's another one I've seen. 
I live up in the hills, and I'll go walking around, you know, walk my dog or walk around with the kids, push the kids in the stroller and that kind of stuff. And once in a while, I'll just see a big old doggy duke <laughs> just just in the street, but but a foot and a half away from the curb. Right. You know what I mean? And sometimes the curb won't even be a curb. It'll just be dirt. Right. It'll just be the side of the hill. It's just, you know, asphalt runs right in the side of the hill. And I think to myself... Really? You couldn't have just kicked it to the side a little bit? <laughs> like, I, look, I don't, I don't say take it home, roll it in jimmies, mount it on a cedar plaque and cover it with shellac. <laughs> how about just a little, how about a little Pele sidekick? Just roll it into the weeds over there. Really? A car drove through it? Really? That's it? I'm just going to ask my dog right here. <laughs> now, when, you know, when I was younger, you step in, in, uh, dog ass. And you get the stick out and the hose, and you try to get it out. Now right. the shoes just get thrown away. Yeah, because everything's got the waffle right. pattern on the bottom, and S gets in there, and that S will be, you'll, you'll be wearing those shoes to your funeral. You'll be in your casket with S right. from 40 years ago on the same. You can't get it out right. of you, the pattern. You can't get it out, and the amount of gagging that you do while trying to remove it is not worth you know, the uh, you know, 49 50 for a new pair. I'm not, and you know, I'm not even Mr. Conscientious, you know, my crap, my dog, I just take it over to the dirt, and then the dog craps, and I kick it in the leaves a little bit, and I sort of, you know, bury it like a cat, but just right in the street, just right in the street. Yeah, you notice that people always try to sell their dogs to everybody, too? Ugh. You know, if, if everybody, every most people hate other people's dogs. Uh, and they I, I, constantly yeah. sell him like, "Hey, isn't he great? Look at him! He's unbelievable! You can't believe what he does! Look at this guy! He's the I best!" Like, I like, I like this one. He thinks he's a person. <laughs> First off, he thinks you're a douchebag, <laughs> and he thinks he's a dog. He doesn't think he's a person. He thinks he's a person. No, he doesn't. You know, and he doesn't see him wanting to drive, uh, drive the car, or right. cook an omelet, or watch TV, or do any of that stuff. He doesn't think he's a person. And he doesn't want to be a person. Yeah. He's got to get a job. <laughs> you know, but look, let me take it from me. Being a person sucks. Yeah. He thinks he's a person. That's the, the other one is not only do you, do you, I used to work at people's houses all the time. I I used to be a Finnish carpenter. I'd go right. into people's houses. I'd install closets. <clears throat> I'd go into your house. I'd work in it for one afternoon. <clears throat> You'd pay me and I'd never see again in my entire life. But it was important to the uh, old bitch behind the door that I make friends with mittens. <laughs> and mittens would be scratching and pawing and, you know, barking. And she'd be doing the, you know what, just, t you know, put your hand out, but put it out slowly. Let him sniff you. Let him get to know you. Once he gets to know, where, where are we going? Right. Aruba? <laughs> we, we gotta be, we, sweetie, I'm, gonna, I'm cutting out. Here's what I'm going to do. Uh, I, I'm gonna throw this closet in your, uh, in, in your hall closet here. You're gonna give me 280 bucks and we're never gonna see each other again. Right. Really, I need to, I, I need to make best friends with your dog? Put the effing dog in the laundry room and let me finish my job. And, and if something ever happens, like my wife was, was bitten by a dog when we first met, uh, German Shepherd grabbed her by the arm and bit her hard enough where you can see it down to the bone, right? Wow. So the, uh, the lady pulls the dog away and, you know, she, uh, you know, puts a bandage on and cleans it up. And then the first thing the lady wants to do is reintroduce the dog to her. <laughs> it's so important that you make friends with the dog. Yeah. Jesus, I mean, the dog practically killed her, and now they they want to, uh, you know, they want them to be best friends again. I, yeah, I, I listen. I don't like that guy, but I don't like this guy either. The guy that can't read dogs. Oh, right. I have the world's friendliest lab. You know, she's one of these dogs that when her tail shakes, her whole body bends in the right. middle, and she goes trotting down the driveway. And once in a while, you'll get that sparklets guy <laughs> or that UPS chick who got bit when they were nine months old, and they'll start freaking. And it's like, you really? What do you think? This is a grizzly bear coming at you? You see the dog is smiling, you know, tail wagging in the air like hot dog from the Archies. Really? You can't decipher the difference between this and a Rottweiler and Watts? And you know what? Their first physical move is always the same. It's that, that move when you get out of a pool when you were a kid and you were cold. You put your two hands under your chin and you raise your elbows. Yeah. That's what they do around dogs that they think are going to attack them. Yeah, and, and, and then they give you the story. 
And the problem, when they give the story, is as a society, we push it along. Like, they go, you know, I was bit when I was a toddler, and no one ever goes, you're 44, get the F over it. <laughs> Everyone goes, oh, geez, hey, sorry, I didn't, I didn't know you, you had a run-in with a dog in 1957. <laughs> All right. Adam Carolla is with us. And this is something I'm tired of, of hearing. And it's an explanation that people have just settled in and believed now. But uh, when you when you run over a pothole in Los Angeles, uh, people will say, well, yeah, it's the rain, man. You know, the uh, the rain made this uh, pothole. Really? Right. So the rain made a, a seven inch pothole right there in the middle of Ventura Boulevard. And if it did, who the F designed the street where a little rain could uh, you know destroy the road? This, uh, Tim, I am, uh, I'm getting angry now because, um, as you know, obviously the economy's in the crapper and California's really in the poop chute. Right. And <clears throat> we can't afford to pay our employees and we're going to a four day work week at the DMV and so on and so forth. I mean, we're strapped, right? We're out of money. We're bankrupt. It's over. Uh, for three years, uh, plus. I've been uh, making the commute out to uh, where you are right now, right. down Wilshire Boulevard from, from La Brea. And for three years, I've been driving through the sprinklers <laughs> that run along the median and that spray <laughs> everywhere but the crap that's in the median. Right. And today... My wipers came on because I have the automatic rain sensing wipers <laughs> as I was hydroplaning through through Lake Wilshire. And by the way, it rained all day the day before. Right. It rained all day this afternoon. Do we really the the the, the ground table saturated already? Do we really need to soak the hibiscus plant for fifteen times in as many days? Do we really need a sprinkler on there. But even if we are going to have it on, do we have to have it cascading into the third lane of Wilshire? How about you put some goddamn astroturf down? How about you do what they do in Phoenix, where they just put a little ground cover, they put some gravel down, and right. a couple indigenous cacti, and they move on? No. We got to flood Wilshire, and we flooded. And by the way, while we're flooding Wilshire, we're also effing up the street because the water's getting under the street and causing the potholes and doing all the stuff you were just talking about. Right. But it rained all day today, and it rained all day. So we're in the middle of one of the wettest winters we've had. The goddamn sprinklers are going. They're not landing anywhere. And then when I get home, I'll turn on the TV and hear Mayor Via Retardo explain to me that we're still living in a drought situation, that we still need to conserve water. Right. So yeah. I'm supposed to tighten my belt. I'm supposed to feel sorry for the city employees. I'm supposed to wonder where all the money is going. And... I'm supposed to flush with a friend because we don't have any water in the city. And I've been driving through that lake for three goddamn years. Yeah. I, I have, I, and I bought this at Home Depot, I think for $29. Water sense, rain sensor. It's a rain sensor. Yes, yeah. I know. L.A., you can drive along the 101 in uh, ba ba basically, uh, ba basically it's the perfect storm. You're basically on the set of the perfect storm. There's, there's George Clooney on the hood. The bows coming up there, and see the sprinklers on on the side of the freeway. Right, You're it, it, it's, it's unbelievable, insane, right? And they have, a, they have a rain sensor. You can go to Home Depot for thirty bucks. And I have on my arm right now. My right arm is the size of Popeyes now because every other time, if not uh, you know three out of four. I got to take the plunger out because there's not enough water pressure to th uh, to throw the toilet paper and the uh, and the crap down the toilet. Right. Yeah. Because you got the 1.6 gallon. Yeah, uh, I got a, I got a, a gallon and a half of water trying to uh, throw this crap down the toilet. Yeah, I know. And uh, you know, uh, I don't know if you, I mean, how intimate you are with your listeners, but uh, uh, Timmy don't drop any six inch stuff. <laughs> He's a one footer. <laughs> So we're supposed to conserve water while we're driving through the lake on Wilshire Boulevard. And by the way, this is Wilshire Boulevard. This isn't Zizix. It's not the Zizix exit. This is Wilshire goddamn Boulevard in the middle of the city. Right. Every day for the last three years. And by the way, I'm assuming every day before that. I just didn't I right, wasn't going that here. route before right. there. It floods the street. Is anyone going to do anything about it? <laughs> Hell no. <laughs> and meanwhile, their answer is, we need more money. Right, exactly. Why? You, you want to just submerge? 
The Mid Wilshire area? You don't have enough money to turn into Atlantis? <laughs> Get your crap together. <laughs> All right, Adam Carolla is with us. Now, when you first got uh, your driver's license at 16, oh, and a buddy got a car, or, you know, he's borrowing dad's car, or whatever. Yeah. When you're 16, your friends have no regard for your car whatsoever. They'll yeah. take out the cigarette lighter, you know, they'll push it in, it'll be red hot. Then they'll put it right in the dashboard and put a, a donut in the dashboard. It'll be there forever. Oh, listen, I, you know, if, can you imagine, you're, like, you're talking you... about the toilet, I can do you work, but it'll do a lot worse than that. <laughs> a lot worse. I've been urinated on whilst driving the car. <laughs> oh, yes. Oh, yes. And only, oh, my only recourse was my dad's rabbit. <laughs> Thank God he's a Corolla, and he and he went with vinyl, everything, no carpet. Oh, good. It literally, literally had rubber floor mats and rubber flooring, like there was no carpet because that, right. that was an extra forty bucks, you know, right. in nineteen seventy nine. Right. Uh, all I could do was take my large root beer that he got me because he worked at uh, Snacks Fifth Avenue, <laughs> oh, over there at the uh, over there at the mall. Off of Moore Park, all I could do was chuck it at him. Right. That was my only defense. It was, to which he threw his at me. So the guy's taking a whiz on me while I'm driving. I throw an entire like 32 ounce jumbo uh, thing. And he chucks his at me. We're just standing by the side of the road. It's, 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 I, I open the car, and it spilled out of the car. <laughs> What an ass! And then, and then there are parents. You know, we wonder why the parents don't like us to lend us the car. You know, <laughs> no, but, my but, dad's rabbit. <laughs> but it wouldn't be uncommon for you know I would borrow a, I'd have my mom's car or something, then pick up all these idiots. We go over to Westwood, and uh, on the four hundred five approaching Westwood, some guy would just take the gar the garage remote out of my mom's car and throw it out of the car. Oh yeah, you know Shut that right out the yeah. window. Yeah. And, and, and can you imagine doing that? You know, I'm forty. I'm forty five. I think you're forty four, forty five. Can you imagine doing that now to a buddy's car? I, I don't think kids are nearly as retarded as uh, we were when we. I mean, I mean, I mean. You think like when one of the Jonas Brothers passes out after too many brews, the other ones draw a penis on his forehead, <laughs> put a cigarette in his mouth, and duct tape him to a lawn chair. I don't. I don't know if they're doing that anymore. <laughs> that's the worst. <clears throat> The biggest thing, you could never fall asleep or pass out in front of anybody. You'd, right. be, you'd be ruined. Yeah, but but the, for the guys who are still awake, that used to be the uh, the funniest part of the evening to the point where you almost wet yourself. Yeah. Uh, drawing he, on a guy's face. You always knew what was going on because you'd get the hushed, hey, come here. <laughs> <laughs> when you got the hey, come here, that meant uh, Kirk had passed out. <laughs> Somebody passed out. You get the quiet, semi-excited. Hey, come here. <laughs> and it, you know, it's funny, too, because you'd hit for the cycle. You'd start off just choking up and making contact. You know? Right. Put a little shaving cream in his hands. <laughs> but eventually, if you didn't wake up, it's like he dropped your pants, put your ass on his head. <laughs> I'm going to get a courtroom artist to draw it. <laughs> we'll get a sprinkler key. Like, you just start going, you just keep going until the person. If, by the way, if the guy was dead. Right. Eventually, you would have just desecrated his corpse because you you would never stop until he woke up. <laughs> right. And when the guy wakes up and he's got uh, you know the the uh, the sharpie all over him, the whipped cream, the cards between his toes. Yeah. Um. He he doesn't get pissed. He's just embarrassed. Yeah. You know, he almost feel like uh, he had it coming on. You he know, it's always, it always a good place for that. The beach. Right. Guy'd have a couple brews and fall asleep out on the towel. You get the copper tone out and go to town. Start collecting, you know, seashells and cigarette butts. Was those, was those a great look? It was great, too, when you, you make that pyramid of, like, cigarette butts or seashells or whatever crap. And when the person popped up, they had that look where they were completely disoriented, but whatever was on their head was falling down their face, and they weren't sure what that was. I love the one moment... My favorite part of life is the one moment, not where the person's angry or happy or sad. It's the moment where they're processing what just happened. <laughs> I got to tell you, I, I, uh, I, I've told the story before, but I, I blew a, 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 a fart into a coffee can once, and uh, I got Jimmy to inhale it. Oh, that's awesome. And, 
you know, I told them it was, you know, f- you know, uh, from Trader Joe's. It was one of those cylinders. Right. And it had like three beans floating around the bottom of it. Right. And you know when you smell coffee, you don't, you bury your face in the can. Oh, yeah. Right. <laughs> and he was doing dishes at my house, we're playing cards, and I just, I put the thing on my ass like it was an airlock. I actually <laughs> twisted it and it went like snapped into place somehow. It's like, whoop. And I just did the shh. And I whipped it around and I said, do you smell this fresh, fresh, uh, fresh uh, baked uh, Sumatra bean? And I just whipped it around and he buried his face into it and went, wow. <laughs> and he pulled his head away. And it was the moment of processing. You know what I mean? That was the best part. Not the part where he started screaming and trying to blow it out of his nose and exhale it later. The one moment where you see the guy's face change. You know when uh, mom has the Tupperware and you think there's orange juice in it and there's milk and you take that swig? Just that one moment. That one, that one, that, 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 that it, it only lasts a second, but it's the face you make for the one second. For one second, you don't know what's going on. Yeah, it's it's being at a party and taking a swig of beer, but the bottle is filled with cigarette butts. Yeah, some guy's been dipping. Yeah. Yeah, yeah. Yeah, yeah it's yeah, the that, one split that's, second. It's the one split second. But you know what? I think we all live for that split second. You we know, do. For, for that split second, you know, that's what uh, enjoyment is, because a lot of work goes into it. <laughs> it does. And there's the payoff, that one second. That one second when you know it's going to happen. I, but and it, it hasn't happened yet. And you know what? I still am am really mature when it comes to that. I went to uh, Ireland with Doug Steckler uh, in 1999. We were over there for the uh, Millennium. It was one of the uh, station event. So we flew over there. And on the way back, uh, we were both drinking. And he passed out in coach. And they give you socks when you mm-hmm. travel. You know, uh-huh. these green socks on, on, on Aer Lingus. Right. And so I collected socks from everybody. And I piled the socks on him. And you couldn't see him. He was under the pile of socks flying back to uh, the United States. And everybody, you know, on the plane was either Irish or Irish American. And they all got the joke. So they all started throwing their socks in. And it was great. And the moment where he realized that he, you know, he woke up and he was, you know, buried in a pile of socks, that one second I got a picture of, that's, you know, that's what you live for. Those are the things you remember. Yeah, once once he's either laughing about it or complaining about it or bitching about it, it's the moment of process. <laughs> that is really the most exciting part of life. Right. You really, if you're lucky, you probably have twelve of those in a lifetime. Right, and that's why you remember all of them too. Yeah, it is. It is. It is weird, and I don't remember what happens after or before, but I remember that one second. Right. All right. Adam Carolla is with us now. <clears throat> growing up in the in the valley. You remember these uh, carnivals and the uh, used to come around every once in a while in a church parking lot, right? Or at the park, yeah. And everybody got real excited. You know, it's two weeks from the carnival; it's a week. It's going to be two days from now, and you, and everybody gets all worked up to get there. And then once you get there, nobody has any effing fun. Now, uh, well, first off, I mean, you're looking at rides that like the zipper, right? And the zipper is the hairiest thing ever ever conceived. And they're all on the back of a steak bed truck. <laughs> so you get the feeling like if there's trouble, they can just take off to the next town. Like, right. I don't like riding roller coasters that are actually on trucks. <laughs> right. I like them on the ground. Like, you know, call me old fashioned. Then the guys that would be running the thing would be wearing like a red jumpsuit, unzipped to their navel, no shirt on underneath, right. and smoking a Winston. <laughs> and the stuff didn't look like it was maintained very well. And right. <laughs> then they had weird stuff. I, I was always too rich for my blood. They had the spin art where you you know you take the paint and the stupid oh, right. you know squeeze bottle and spray you know spray it on a piece of paper. Right. And then they had the other thing, which was the cruelest of all things, which is you, you know you throw the dime, you win the goldfish. So now you're, you're looking around. Can you imagine now if somebody said? Hey, I got a hefty bag with a goldfish in. I need you. I need you to drag it around for the next six hours. <laughs> He'd be like, "F you! What, what kind of prize is that?" Yeah, he'd try not to win that. Fish is going to be dead by the time you get home anyway. <laughs> the over under on the fish is really the weekend, right? <laughs> right? And you, you first thing you do is you go win the goldfish, and you're, like, you're walking around like a retard carrying a bag with a fish in it for the entire. You got to set it down. You can't eat your cotton candy. <laughs> you got a fish in that. They don't do that anymore, do they? You know, I think they. They still do because we were up at the. Uh, I take. I took my daughter to the carnival, 
and she won one of those things. She won a gold. Yeah, thing. she threw a ping pong ball into a uh, into a little uh, you know fish bowl, and all of a sudden I had to carry that thing around. <laughs> you know, and I had to drive it back to Los Angeles. Is that a, really? Is that a prize? No, it's a pain in the ass. <laughs> That's what I'm saying. Yeah. And then what do you? What do they think? You have an old whole aquarium with no fish in it, just at home, <laughs> ready to go. <laughs> right. Yeah, it's, you a got... cra- <laughs> it's a crazy notion. Like, oh yeah, I got a 55 gallon aquarium in my entry hall. Water, filter, <laughs> castle, everything. Just no fish. Thank God we got this goldfish. Yeah, I thought it was odd. I mean, you know, giving away an animal if you win. I mean, you know, it's like, uh, hey, you got a, a ping pong ball into a into right. a, uh, a dog's cage. Here you go. You got a puppy. I know. And then, uh, listen, the cotton candy has to be about the worst goddamn thing ever, ever created. I'm sorry. I don't want to sound un-American, but it tastes like crap. It gets all over your hands. It comes on a crazy stick. There's no way to eat it without getting it all over your face. <laughs> and it really doesn't taste very good. It's not like a fudge brownie or right. a Snickers bar or something like that. Right. It's pink and powder blue, by the way. I don't know when they introduced powder blue. <laughs> I grew up around pink cotton candy. Just looked like it just looked like orange insulation. Right. And at a certain point, about ten years ago, somebody said, "You know what? We need another color of cotton candy, <laughs> and it should be another weird hue of blue." <laughs> Uh, Where did the blue crap come in, Tim? And I don't who know. signed off on that? I don't know. Not me. It was always pink when I was a kid. I think it started looking like that Owens Corning fiberglass, and people started getting freaked out. <laughs> All right, Adam Carolla is with us. You know, at these uh, at these uh, carnivals, when when we'd go as uh, as kids, uh, you know, rides were you know you buy a ticket for a quarter, you get on a ride. Now you buy a ticket for a dollar, and it's like nine tickets to get on a ride. I know, it's weird. And it's also, you know, like, here's the whole thing. Don't wait 33 years in between Disneyland visits like I did. Right. Because I went to Disneyland over the Christmas break, and, you know, because we're the Corollas, I think I went one time with my family when I was, like, nine, and, you know, it was like, that was $4 to get in or something. Right, exactly. And, you know, so now I'm walking with the wife. We're pushing the kids down Main Street. I'm like, uh, how much these tickets sent me? They're, they're, no, well, we got a deal. We got them on sale with 86 bucks. I'm like, what? what? Yeah, each. What? 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 Right. What? I could have got could have got a decent prostitute. <laughs> I mean, a solid, you know, six plus style prostitute for eighty six. What for you and the kids? Oh, the kids were deal. They're 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 forty bucks. It's like right. what 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 what? Yeah, don't you have to go every year? Then it just it's like postage stamps. You know what I mean? It'd be like it'd be like if you bought a gallon of gas in nineteen thirty three right. for eighteen cents, and then you just woke up a month ago and bought a gallon for four bucks. You'd be like. What the? You have to. You have to. It has to go up three cents a year. Right. Otherwise, you're you're in for shock. No, you're right. And and the hooker. I mean, you're going to spend three hundred dollars on tickets. You're going to spend another three hundred dollars in size. That's six hundred dollars. And you can really enjoy yourself in the uh, the hooker business for six hundred dollars. You know, I never combined the food with the ticket for the missus and all that. But you're right, Tim. I just kept thinking about eighty six for me. Right. But you could really step up from a streetwalker to a high quality, <laughs> you know, high end, classy call girl type. Right. But even if it is a streetwalker or it's high end, it's always you know that hour with her is always better than the Pirates of the Caribbean. <laughs> You know it's funny whenever you go to whenever I go to any of those kind of things all I can think of is when am I going to get home to my TV set <laughs> But there's no way you can play that card 45 minutes in because you'll get the stink eye from the old lady. Right. And she'll right. be complaining you didn't have it. But you'll, 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 you, you can tea, you, you give it that like hour 45, two hour and 15 minutes. You'll soften up the soil with a well placed yawn. <laughs> <laughs> you'll do a little back crack move. <laughs> and then she'll go, you, you, you hold up. Okay. Oh, no, yeah, no, no. Yeah, yeah. And then you start working in stuff. You know, uh, traffic should be getting thick in the next. Uh, beat that traffic, you know. But you have to keep playing it like you want to be there. Right. Listen, it was up to me. I'd sleep over at the place. I'm just saying, you know, backs. Uh, I'll be okay. I'll be okay. But yeah, uh, the kids look like they're uh, wearing out a little bit over there. I'm <laughs> so with that thing with every. I'm that way with everything. Right. I, go to, I go to a Dodger game. 
and you worry about the traffic on the way there. You get there, and you're like, ah, oh, it's only the third inning. You know, would I feel like an a-hole if I left in the fourth? Right. It's so, it's so, it's it, it's such a great mentality. Everywhere you go, the second you walk in, you're like, when the f can we get out of here? <laughs> and how can I not let the person who I went with know that I want to get out of here? <laughs> I can subtly start laying down, you know, little subtle hints and little beating the traffic is a nice right, one. Right, right. You know, if you really want to score points and you're with the uh, wife, you can miss the kids. That one works too. Right, exactly. That's what they're up to. Yeah, so, you really got to get home. Though. Meanwhile, you walk in that, you make a beeline for the television set. You plop your ass down. You start watching TiVo. Forty five minutes later, the miss is like, "You missed the kids, right? Yeah, they're upstairs." <laughs> huh? Oh, hold on. Let me hit pause. Let me hear what you said. The ki- whose kids? <laughs> right. Where are they? <laughs> oh yeah, yeah. No, we'll be there tomorrow, right? <laughs> All right, Adam Kroll is with us. Uh, do you ever do this when you're driving for a long distance with your wife? And, you know, you live with your wife, so, you, you know, you don't have a lot of things to say to each other all the time. But a buddy calls you on your cell phone. You're like, hmm, do I pick this up and piss her off and enjoy a 10-minute conversation? Or do I uh, just hit ignore? And you pick it up. And then you got to try to somehow, like, involve her in the conversation. Right. You know? And, and you, you, you want to convey it. You want to convey it the same way, like, if you're on a speakerphone and you're talking to one of your J.O. buddies and you're going to the airport and there's a black guy driving the town car. Right. You don't want to give him you want to give him a little heads up because you don't want him to say something stupid. Yeah. You Mal- Malibu Dan. Say something about your wife or about the guy. You know, uh, I'm, I'm heading to LAX. By the way, Lucius, awesome driver. Keep up the work, my main man. Anyway, what were we saying? <laughs> <laughs> Malibu Dan used to be the worst with that because he gets stoned, and, and and you know when he gets when he got high, he would just say things, and the nicest guy in the world. But occasionally, what he would say would sound pretty racist. Right. But he doesn't have a racist bone in his body. Right. Yeah, I know. And there's this weird kind of yeah. I'm with the I'm with uh, with my wife. She's sitting right next to me. Yeah, driving to uh, Bear Mountain. So uh, anyway, Rick, what's up? <laughs> <laughs> Lay it all out. <laughs> right. Yeah. Now he's yeah, got nothing but, to say. Yeah. The setup is five minutes, and then it's <laughs> like, what's happening? But <laughs> right. ma- this is Malibu Dan did this. Uh, we went. We had uh, a limousine, and I don't know, remember where we were going. It's a station event, and the driver happened to be a black guy. And Malibu Dan was, you know, he was getting high in the back and talking to everybody. And then he would talk to the driver and go, hey, uh, uh, bro, man, what's uh, what's happening up there? I'm like, right. hey, Dan, 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 right. you can't change the inflection. And he goes, right. he goes, I didn't even know I was doing it. Wow. You know? Well, let me let me say this, and, and let me ask your opinion, and, and, and I know you have a lot of guys that try for a living listening to the show. So let me just put this weird little piece of protocol etiquette out for you i have been driven in a, in a stretch limousine quite a few times just for various you know functions and uh, things that have to do with the business i never want to be the a-hole celebrity who hops in the car and puts the divider up <laughs> but oftentimes i want the divider up because either we're smoking the weed right or we're having some kind of horrible, disgusting conversation, or you're trying to get it on, or you're trying to do one of a thousand things back there. Either way, when you're in the back of a limo and you have three or four of your drunken buddies, the last thing you want is the uptight chick listening to all the disgusting stuff that you just did at the club. Right. So, but... When you raise the thing, it's sort of an admission of guilt. Like, oh, uh, look, you queer baits going to all uh, go down on each other back there? Or what's, you know, they assume the worst, you know what I mean? They think they're going to bring it down. They're going to be a daisy chain of you guys back there. So my point is, and they just leave the crap down the whole time. I'm saying this. If you drive a limo that has the divider, you should nicely say to the person, listen, I'm going to put this divider up unless, yeah. unless enjoy you don't yourselves. Want me to. When you when you need me, go ahead and put it down. Until then, enjoy. That's great. And just put it up. Right. And if they want to bring it down, then they'll bring it down. Or if they have something to say, they'll bring it down. Don't make them bring it up. It makes you feel elitist, and it seems like you're doing coke off each other's asses back there. <laughs> and you, you notice, I bet you do this too. When you, when you go to put it up, first of all, 
when you want to put it up, there's going to be a five minute pause of, mm, should I do it? Should I not do it? Should I put it up? And then you inch it. It goes yeah. up two inches. Yeah, they'll never notice if it goes up, you know, an inch a mile. <laughs> they'll never notice that they're looking at a barrier where once light passed through. They're never going to notice. <laughs> but you know, you're absolutely gonna... right, though. It should be the driver putting up saying, guys, enjoy yourself back up, uh, back there. I'll be here if you need me. I have been in a thousand limos. I've never been with a driver that said, I'll just put this up. And when you need me, you bring it down. <laughs> never, never, and it should just be standard etiquette. Am I right? Right, exactly. The other thing I've never been, I've never found in a in a in a limo, is a radio I could work. Right. It's up above your head. It's pitch black. You have that crazy Galactica thing going on <laughs> on the ceiling now. You're you're mesmerized by Orion's belt. That that's always working. You're staring at the at the at the, at the Big Dipper, but it's purple, green neon, <laughs> and somebody says put some tunes on. Right. And you go up in every single limo. Anyone, please, please call me a liar. Check this out. There's never the knob. There are always just 47 buttons, and it's black as coal. And so you hit one button, and eventually you turn the thing on, and it's ranchero music, and it's blaring, and you can't turn it down because there's no knob. There's a, there's a volume button, but you'll keep hitting buttons, and eventually the face will pop off and land in your beer. <laughs> Really? You're going to do the face pop-off stereo uh, up top right. in the limo? They all have it, and none of them have the knob ones either. And, and here's another thing that, that limousine companies have got to stop doing. When a guy's paying, like you're paying probably, you know, when you do pay for it, 100 bucks an hour for a stretch, right? Right. And then you go to, uh, you know, taste what the guy's got in the bar, and it's, uh, you know, Seagram's, um, or it's less than Seagram's gym. The right. vodka is uh, something the guy just made in his bathtub that's, that morning. Right. So I mean, how about weird, some crazy clear crystal bottle? You're right. not sure what it is. <laughs> how about some high end bottles there for a guy who's paying high end prices? A little uh, bottle of Grey Goose. Yeah, and and then there's these like proclamations, like you, you want me to stop and get some ice, right? Uh, yeah, I want you to stop and get some ice before you pick me up. <laughs> Not now. It's weird, yeah. And there's a weird, they have a weird mixture. I have like a zesty V8. Right. And uh not a seven up but a bubble up or something <laughs> and then the weird clear stuff in the in the decanter that looks like it's been there for a thousand years. It's really it's the booze it's how Larry Tate would make a highball on Bewitched. <laughs> He'd come out speaking of that. Remember those uh remember those sixties and seventies, you know, sitcoms and, and dramas when the guy'd come home from work? Right. And he'd go, now imagine this. Imagine what a time they were living in. Larry Tate would have a tough day down on Madison Avenue, right? Or, or Darren would come home and say, Jesus, I need a belt. Right. I need a drink. He'd come in the front door. He'd loosen up his tie. He'd walk right across the living room to that little mobile serving bar. Right. He'd, the, meanwhile, the wife's in the kitchen making meatloaf. He'd walk right up to the mobile bar. He'd throw the cap off the thing. The the ice bucket would be filled. Right. <laughs> He'd grab the tongs, throw a couple things on there, dump a little uh, Crown Royal on there, and make his way into the kitchen. Then the wife would come and, oh, honey, you're home. Right. Uh, who's been filling that ice bucket? <laughs> <laughs> what kind of woman is he married to? That's a woman. <laughs> Tim, could you imagine him right. coming home your wife had a bucket full of ice? No. <laughs> yeah, if these guys would come home, they'd be two hours late, there'd be a bucket, they'd be an hour early, there'd be a bucket. Who's bucket full of ice? Who's filling this thing? Yeah, no, the guys get home nowadays and... Uh, you, there's a Swanson hungry man in the freezer if you want to eat. Yeah, or uh, where are we going to dinner? You know, I mean, uh, you know, you're right. The the art of cooking. I think this is the last generation that's going to cook. Jesus Christ! I got to tell you, uh, one of the greatest conversations I had with my wife is, uh, you know, she uh, she she called she called in some uh, some uh, sushi when it was pick it up, and then and then and then gave me the you know at the end of a long long work day for me, gave me the. Uh, Hey, why don't you go pick it up? <laughs> I, uh, I said, literally, I just said, I said, look, I'm going to need you to get into the expensive car that I lease you. I'm going to need you to drive down the long driveway of the house that I pay for. I need you to go through the gates that I built. Mm -hmm. You drive down the hill. 
to the sushi place and then pull out the credit card that I pay for <laughs> and drive back up the hill in the car that I leave and come back to the mansion that I pay for. And I will be waiting here. Are you high? What the hell has happened? What happened from the time where the ice bucket was right, filled yeah. to go pick up your own goddamn sushi? <laughs> You know, they have taken it from, they've taken it from, not only are we not cooking, right. guess who's flying? Right. And you're also, going on the run. And when you're at a party and two or three of the wives get together, they'll try to one-up each other on how crappy they are at cooking. <laughs> you know, oh, you don't, really? you can't cook a grilled cheese? I can't boil pasta. You yeah. couldn't boil pasta. <laughs> I know. When did this? When did knowing stuff be become? For, you know, for the uh, bourgeois. You know. <laughs> oh, geez, you can. <laughs> you sew? I don't sew. Are you nuts? Part of Guatemala? You from? <laughs> no, I don't sew. I don't, do any, I don't know how to do anything. Yeah. What is that? Right. With you a know. certain amount of pride, and guys do it too. Oh, oh yeah. Geez, I got a flat. I didn't know. I had to call AAA. I was at home, but I don't know where the hell the lug nut is on the thing. Yeah. I don't know how to get the jack out of the truck. <laughs> I mean, remember when guys, how many times, by the way, growing up as a guy, you'd at least hear the stories, you know, where the guy, you know, your friend was BSing, but he'd tell you that story. Yeah, I'm leaving the 7-Eleven, and this uh, guy comes in. You know, right. looks like a tough guy. He's wearing a pea coat. He bangs me in the shoulder. He doesn't say sorry. I, ask, I, I tell the guy, you want some? You want some? And he backs down. He knew I meant this. And you know the guy's BSing, but that's his story. Right. Now you hear your buddies, and you're like, what happened? Oh, jeez. I, uh, I was on La Cienega, and, uh, you know, I tooted my horn at a guy. He got out of the car. I freaked out and rolled the window up. I didn't know what to do. I crapped myself. I just called 911. <laughs> right. admit, absolutely like, admit. Really? You're, you're going to advertise your puss? Yeah. Remember, at least back in the day, you would say, hey, this guy, yeah, the guy got out of the car. I got out of the car. I said, you want some? You, you want trouble? You found it. Right, exactly. Now everyone's just advertising their pussy. Well, yeah, uh, getting back to uh, this, my wife did this, uh, and, and again, she, you know, she's great with the kid and, and uh, keeps the house rolling and uh, is not afraid to clean. I mean, we don't have a housekeeper. She does all that stuff. She, you know, she controls the house. Oh, really? But she, but she will occasionally <laughs> say to me, she'll, you know, I'll be wearing a shirt that's wrinkled and I go, oh, man, I think this thing needs ironing. And she'll say, you want me to do it for you? <laughs> yeah. yeah, I had a funny one with my wife. Uh, you know, we have uh, the, the Sylvia, the cleaning woman, comes every Friday and spends, you know, 12 hours doing the crap my wife could be doing during the week. And uh, a couple months ago, she says to me, you know, the house is uh, looking a little shabby, a little rough around the edges. <laughs> and, uh, you know, I'm honestly... I'm thinking about having Sylvia coming out two days a week. <laughs> I thought, oh, for a second, I thought you were going to tell me you are going to pick up a mop. <laughs> Boy, that was close. <laughs> really? That's the conversation? <laughs> Think about having Sylvia out on Wednesdays, too? <laughs> this is awesome what we've become. It, it is amazing. But uh, I will say this. My wife, I, I, I said to her, I said, listen, you can stay home. Uh, I'll pay for the the cars, the the house, the kid. Uh, I'll give you a credit card. I'll give you cash, whatever. But as long as you're home, um, you know you got to uh, you know break out that mop once in a while, and she does. Wow! I, mean, I think she's like you know from another planet. You got to keep her. Yeah. Yeah. Don't don't have her talk about it at the party. She's matter of fact, she doesn't even she'll like. Be, she'll be a pariah. In oh, absolutely. Of her other female friend. Yeah. No, she'll. Uh, she, you know, she'll be cooking and sewing. Yeah, but put, I, I put ice in the bucket. And she doesn't even like when uh, somebody comes in to clean because she's so self conscious. She's got to clean the house before they come. You know. <laughs> well, she's a keeper. I think I got a lucky there. Hey, uh, so the uh, uh, the movie's still out, the Hammer, huh? That's still uh, selling like uh, hotcakes. Yeah, it's doing uh, it's doing real nice. Got uh, Sports Illustrated, Sports Comedy of the Year. Look at that! Just a uh, pretty nice uh, accolade over there in Sports Illustrated, and, and what was in their magazine and everything too. It wasn't like some kind of on, online whatever. Right. And uh, yeah, it's going great. You can go to uh, Amazon and pick it up, or wherever and pick it up. And uh, as a matter of fact, if you uh, go and pick it up, and sign the 
send the jacket in to me, I'll sign it. I've done thousands of them. But a self-addressed stamped envelope that's open. Uh, yeah, don't do the thing that my listeners do, which is seal the self-addressed return envelope. <laughs> it's happened a few times. I got a lot of stoners. Hey, what other projects you got going on? I know you're you're busy. You got a lot of Hollywood crap going on. Like Doctor Drew's got a million things going on. Uh, yeah, I got a I got a couple of uh, got a couple of features I'm working on, and uh, I'm actually working on a sitcom. Is that right? As well, which is. I never wanted to do a sitcom, but uh, at a certain point, you know, it's hard to say uh, no to super easy money. Yeah, and, and, and no uh, longer having to get up at four in the morning. Uh, yeah, so, uh, you know, I haven't really, you know, my whole career was always about, oh, let's do Crank Yankers, and let's do The Man Show, and let's right. do a bunch of Love Line and radio, and just stuff where we could do what we've been doing for the last hour. Right. But at a certain point, it'd be nice to get paid. <laughs> <laughs> so... Uh, uh, yeah, like the uh, like uh, you know the everyone loves Raymond money or Seinfeld money. Well, I mean, seriously, there there's an element. I, I'm uh, you know I'm no spring chicken anymore. I have a family, and I'm starting to think you know hell if you can't beat them, join them. And uh, hell, you're at least as funny as Jim Belushi, right? <laughs> I mean, Charlie Sheen can't be that much funnier than me. <laughs> right. Yeah, I mean, and, you know, uh, Seinfeld, who's the obviously the exception, but he made over a billion and a half dollars on that show. Oh, they do those They do those Forbes, you know, what celebrities have made the most right. last year thing. Right. And it's like Oprah will be like $200 million, and then second will be like Seinfeld, like $65 million bucks, except for the difference is he doesn't work. Right, exactly. He just sits at home and gets that check. That, that's insane. Insanity, um, and uh, yeah, I'd like uh, I'd like to uh, you know see if I could get in on some of that insanity. Excellent. Well, I hope that uh, works out. Thanks, Danny. I really do. All right, thanks for coming on, buddy. Always a pleasure. Really Jimmy. appreciate it. And uh, buy the hammer on Amazon dot com, and then listen every morning at six a.m. and on the weekends as well. Well, you know, it sounds like a tape show on weekends, but I guess it's live. You come in and do that live. Yeah, right? That's right. Wow. I'm trying to get enough talking. All right, every Friday for the next hundred years, Jimmy. <laughs> How about that, buddy? I appreciate it, man. And uh, thanks for uh, spending a couple of minutes here with us. <laughs> Has it been? That felt like nothing. <laughs> All right, thanks, man. I appreciate it. All right, Jimmy. All right, take care. There he goes, Adam Carolla, man. And one of the uh, highlights of, uh, well, I got to say my career, you know, sitting there for an hour. Every uh, Friday night, talking to a guy who makes me uh, laugh my ass off. Adam Carolla, everybody. All right, it is the uh, uh, Tim Conway Jr. Show. We're going to do news at 9 o'clock, uh, nine, probably at 9.15 when we come back here. Do you know what's going on with that news? Well, if you like going to dinner parties, there might be work for you in France. And the Womb Raider has an unhealthy obsession with the Tomb Raider. We'll talk about this and more after the break. Oh, boy. All right, you are listening to the Tim Conway Jr. Show live at 97.1 FM Talk. More shows like this at 971fmtalk.com.